Hi everyone and welcome to another Webinar Wednesday. My name's Kylie and I'm here today with our host Mike. Today we're going to be talking about hazard identification in construction. So a quick overview of some of the things we're going to touch on. We're going to test your hazard identification knowledge, discuss specific hazards involving OSHA's focus for and their safety requirements, discuss situational awareness and environmental factors that can cause risks, easy tips and tricks on how to identify hazards and how to fix them, what options are available to protect employees, and how to improve employee hazard identification skills. Thanks, Kylie. Yeah, we're going to focus on the fatal four today for the webinar, and that would include falls, caught in between, struck by, and electrocution cases. So we'll just jump right into it and try to test out your knowledge. Do we see any fall hazards here? We'll leave it up for a little bit for everybody who's watching. See if you can pick anything out from this picture. Okay, hopefully everybody at least identified a few issues going on with this residential construction job. Let's start off. One of the first concerns is that there's a worker working from a carpenter's scaffold that has no guardrail, extends too far beyond either end, and is not wide enough. Uh, essentially, it looks like it's a two by six that the employee's standing on. Uh, the worker does not have proper access to the scaffold. So in this case, we don't see a ladder, we don't see a set of stairs. Um, even if the employee climbed out of the window, in some cases that may be adequate to, to get in, onto scaffolding, but not in this type of situation. We could also assume that this individual is above 10 feet, you know, hence the lack of guardrail being a deficiency. Now let's move to the worker that's inside the window. You know, this individual, again, we could assume is higher than six or more feet above a lower level, uh, in which case the window opening poses a significant fall hazard. Typically in this case, uh, standard guardrail would be applied to cover that window opening off. Now let's move to the worker on the ground. <clears throat> Typically, when employees are working below scaffolding, some form of falling object protection would be required. Uh, that may include components of the guardrail system itself or screen or mesh. Uh, this employee could be exposed to falling material, debris, as well as an employee uh, up working above that has a lack of fall protection. Hard hats may prove to be some level of a suitable form of protection, but ultimately companies should do their best to keep people out from underneath this, this type of a setup period. Uh, using caution tape, cones, or just simply cordoning off the area below and access to that doorway would probably be the best solution. All right, so again, let's take another moment. Let's check out these pictures and see what we can find. Okay, let's start with the one in the upper left-hand corner. Obviously, there are a couple of employees working in a trench. Uh, we could assume, I think it's safe to assume, that they're probably uh, well in over their heads, probably more than five feet deep, in which case fall, some form of cave-in protection would be necessary. Uh, just from the picture, it looks like this, the soil appears to be relatively unstable as well, you know, ma mainly comprised of sand or, or granular material. Uh, the employee in the back, it looks like if you look closely to the right, it, it appears as though there's already been some level of soil movement there or disturbance. So that's pretty indicative of uh, unstable condition, or we could obviously see that some level of amount of soil has already shifted or moved. Um, ladder access, it's really hard to see from that picture if it's adequate. Uh, but ultimately here with this, no protective system. You know, they haven't used a trench shield or any type of, of shoring. Uh, no benching techniques, sloping techniques are questionable at best here. The one on the right, open electrical boxes or access to live components. You know, we understand that there may be temporary installations uh, on construction sites as they are, you know, temporary and, and installations will be made more permanent as work progresses. In this case, simply putting a cover in place should suffice. Uh, the picture on the bottom left in the, in the corner, you know, another example similar to what we looked at in the first residential construction picture where an employee is exposed to a fall you know more than likely six or more feet above a lower level you know options here would include some form of a guardrail system uh, perhaps uh, even utilizing a fall arrest harness and lanyard uh, the picture on the bottom right hand corner 
it appears as though an employees have used an A-frame ladder to access a, a, a section of a catwalk. You know, this may be uh, currently being constructed right now at a facility. Uh, the A-frame ladder is not suitable access for that type of a leading edge, and the caution tape does not pose uh, enough of a, of a fall prevention uh, remedy or technique due, simply due to the fact that it's not going to be able to support the required weight. All right, so let's get into our first section of the focus four. We're going to talk about fall protection. We'll discuss conditions that require the use of fall protection, and Mike will help us out with options available to, pro to protect the workers. Yeah, Kylie, this is probably one of the more significant issues related to construction work period. It's typically at the top of the list uh, every year, or at least for the last several uh, in OSHA's top 10 frequently cited standards, and for good reason. Uh, a lot of different types of construction jobs require employees to work at height, and it doesn't take much of a fall to result in a serious injury or even death. And we can see here from as little as four to six feet above a lower level, uh, any one of a number of things can happen. Now, I just want to point out before we get too far into this section, you know, we're mainly going to focus on uh, the more common aspects of fall protection or arrest and, and prevention. There are other options uh, to work at height safely, which would include working from ladders, uh, working from scaffolding, and working from aerial lifts. We may get into that in another webinar. You'll have to stay tuned with us for that one. But for this one today, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of focus on, like I said, some of the more uh, common aspects of fall prevention and protection. So when is it needed? Now, in construction, most cases, we, we need to make sure that employees are protected from falls six or more feet above a lower level. Uh, typically, that might consist of walkways or ramps, open sides and edges. Now, that, could, that can consist of a, of a wall opening, an elevator shaft, uh, an area where you know, two, uh, a large doorway might span two sections of a building where work's being completed beneath. Holes, open floor holes, that could be in just a walking working surface or on a uh, roof deck. Concrete forms and rebar, employees installing and tying together rebar oftentimes work at considerable heights. Uh, applying forms and even tearing down forms, they would need some form of a, a fall arrest or prevention there. Excavations, uh, a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that there are situations where excavations need to be covered or guarded appropriately. Uh, typically, the cases of which you can't see the leading edge or there's vegetation or other debris overhanging. It's also not a bad idea that once a company leaves a job site where excavation work's been performed, that uh, there are barriers or some form of covers or guardrails put up to keep unauthorized people out in a bay. Rooftops, obviously, that would include flat roof work as well as residential construction, wall openings, uh, and just overhand bricklaying. So let's talk about some options. Now, the first option that we have, safety nets, we will get into these in a little bit more detail. Probably one of the least common that I've personally seen out at job sites, uh, just due to some of the strict requirements that are in place for initial setup and the fact that a serious injury could still occur from an employee falling into a safety net. Uh, I will be honest, most cases where I've witnessed a safety net being used on a job site, it's primarily been to contain falling material and to keep that from getting somewhere where it should, whether that be falling on employees or maybe a critical aspect of another construction operation, uh, or in the case that I'm thinking, it was a helicopter pad at a, at a facility. Handrails will cover standard guardrail systems, which are pretty straightforward. We'll get into a little information on safety harnesses, and it's one thing to really consider before any work actually commences is that your form of fall prevention or protection has to be in place. There are few exceptions that would permit or allow an employee to work on an elevated surface, again, six or more feet above a lower level without these. That's typically if there's an initial inspection of a rooftop or while employees are installing their protective systems. So let's spend a moment or two and talk about a personal fall arrest system. Employees must be properly trained, and that's an understatement, especially somebody that's not been in the construction industry, putting on a harness, 
wearing it properly, setting it up is not something that may come naturally to everyone. So one of the first and most important elements of using a fall arrest harness is a thorough inspection. Um, typically the, the easiest way to start the inspection process is to grab the back D-ring, you know, make sure all the buckles and, and connection points are unsecured, and just let it hang. Shake it out a little bit, make sure the arm and leg straps are, are free flowing. Uh, once you get it oriented correctly, you essentially put the harness on just like you would a, a vest. Um, once it's on, you can start your adjustments. You want to make sure that the chest strap uh, is secured squarely across the breast of the chest. The leg straps should be secured tight, but not overly tight. Uh, you should be able to slide a hand in flat in between the harness and your leg. Um, you know, certainly adjusting a harness too tight would could, or could co possibly create some circulation problems. Um, once it's secured and you're assured that everything is adjusted properly, certainly the back D-ring up in between the shoulder blades or the base of the neck, as you can see in the picture, you know, we then need to start determining other elements. You know, an important aspect of this system is the lanyard. There are many different types of lanyards, uh, whether they're retractable, whether they are, are designed to extend and slow the person's descent. Uh, we're not going to get in those in great detail today, but an important aspect of the two uh, in, in conjunction with the walking working surface is fall distance. You certainly want to make sure that your lanyard uh, and how it's designed to be used uh, in conjunction with the height that the work is commencing, uh, as well as a couple other factors like stretch or harness uh, ride up and OSHA's safety factor are all taken into consideration and ultimately you want to make sure that the system all prevents you from striking a lower level. Uh, another aspect that many people don't consider is what happens in the event of a fall. Rescue is critical. Most people involved with a with a fall with a fall arrest harness may only be suspended for upwards of five minutes before uh, just the sheer pressure and contact points start to create some circulation problems and it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that a person could lose consciousness at that point in time. So anytime one of these systems is used, uh, you re really want to take a close look at uh, how you would ultimately get a person down, whether there are ladders nearby, an aerial lift, because you don't want somebody dangling for an extended period of time. Okay, guardrails. Uh, we have here Either, you know, most uh, swings as far as uh, three-inch measurements are concerned. I mean, typically, we want to start off with a 42 top rail height. Uh, OSHA will allow a, a variance of three inches either way, uh, just for variables that could come up during installation. You want to keep in mind that whatever your top rail measurement is, your mid rail is half of that. <clears throat> now, with a tow board height in construction of three and a half inches above the leading edge or, or decking, uh, we could ultimately use two by fours. They are an effective source of guardrail. Uh, they could be secured with spikes uh, tied together and, you know, typically strong uh, and, and secure. We ultimately have to make sure that the guardrail system can support at least 200 pounds of force down against it. Uh, the other thing we need to consider with our guardrail systems is certainly they're installed on on either side of an elevated surface open to a fall or any leading edge. The other is the material that they're made out of. Uh, we want to make sure that it doesn't pose any type of a, of, a, of a cut hazard to an employee if they were to run their hands across it. Like I mentioned before, safety nets, although not very common, can be used as a form of fall protection. Uh, not really prevention since essentially in most cases an employee is going to fall into it. So a little bit more of a reactive approach to this. Um, place no more than 30 feet below the work area. Certainly if tools or materials or debris would accumulate in the net, those would have to be removed as needed. The net shouldn't be placed any more than 8 to 13 feet away from the work area, the leading edge. And nets, once they're installed, would have to be drop tested before use. All right, now let's see if we've learned anything. It's time for an Insta safety poll. So the question is, when is fall protection needed? A, a fall of eight feet or more. B, never. 
C, a fall of six feet or more, and D, a fall of four feet or more. So take a moment, let the answers come in. Okay, thank you, Kylie. Yeah, this one should be relatively easy since I've mentioned that several times. So hopefully everyone got the correct answer of C, a fall of six or more feet. All right, on to the next section. Next, we're going to cover electrical safety. We're going to discuss the safety requirements, hazard prevention and control, the most common injuries, and some PPE for electrical safety. Okay, let's get right into it. Yeah, electrical hazards. Uh, these types of incidents or accidents are typically caused by a combination of three factors. Now, by themselves, certainly, but a combination of unsafe equipment and or installation, environmental conditions, such as plainly working out in wet weather, and unsafe work practices. All right, so here's another picture. We're going to test your knowledge again. Does anybody recognize any hazards here? Give some time, leave the picture up for a little bit. And let's see if Mike can help us out. Okay, even though there may be more than what's outlined in our corrective slide, uh, what we'd want to do is focus solely on the electrical concerns. And in this case, uh, it looks like to me there are more, there's more than at one location where employees may be exposed to contact with live parts uh, just be, simply because they're within 10 feet from it. So your scaffold was erected four and a half feet from a 7.2 kV power line. Uh, if we look just above that, uh, that, that bubble towards the right of the scaffolding, we can also see another power pole there with some loose wiring as well. Now we can also scrutinize the scaffolding. It appears as though that working level doesn't have appropriate guardrail in place. But we want to make sure that if we're concerned with electrical hazards and contact, we keep employees and materials as far away as possible. So hazards, exposed electrical parts. Our options in dealing with situations like this could be to isolate or de-energize electrical parts. Uh, we may even be able to use lockout tagout principles in some cases. You know, ultimately, completely de-energizing a piece of equipment before we work on it is going to greatly reduce or completely eliminate the hazard of electrical contact, shock, or electrocution. Cover plates, you can see in this picture, uh, perhaps the application and re, well, rerouting of that wire and then the application of a cover plate would prevent contact. We may also be able to insulate uh, live wiring as well. That is another option that construction companies may have uh, if they are able to plan ahead of time with a local power supplier. Uh, they could have the lines or electrical items covered or insulated. That way, if there is some type of inadvertent contact, the insulation material will prevent uh, flow of electricity. Maintain adequate safe distances. Now, there are some variances to this, and this distance can be uh, altered or increased as necessary, but typically in most applications, uh, we want it to maintain at least 10 feet between workers, the equipment, and energized parts, pow overhead power lines, that is. All right, so once again, let's see if we recognize any hazards here. Just leave it up for a little bit for you guys. Take some time to check this one out. Okay, so focusing in on the electrical concerns, we do have a situation here where an employee has a ladder in close proximity to some lines that are leading into a weather head. Um, it also appears as though the employee is working uh, on a leading edge with a lack of fall prevention or protection. Now, they're using a fiberglass ladder, is what it appears, but even then, there could be inadvertent contact with the line, and the transfer of the flow of electricity could result in electrocution or even uh, significant electrical burns. So that actually brings us to some of the more common injuries associated with electrical contact. Electrical shock is received when an electrical current passes through the body. Certainly, this can cause severe damage or death. Uh, in most, in some, in, throughout industry and construction across the U.S., at least one person is electrocuted on a daily basis. So it is relatively common. 
you will get an electrical shock if a part of your body completes an electrical circuit by one of two ways, touching a live wire in electrical ground or touching a live wire in another wire at a different voltage. Most common injuries uh, related to electrocution cases, burns, electrical burns or arc flash burns, thermal burns, uh, burns from making contact with live parts to the skin could result in second or third degree uh, damage. Uh, another aspect of thermal burns that oftentimes goes unnoticed is the damage to the internal organs or tissue of a person. So from the outside, they may not look injured, but the inside, there could have been a significant amount of damage done. A typical arc flash explosion can range in upwards of 35,000 degrees. So essentially, if an employee is not properly detected and that occurs, uh, clothing, skin is going to take a significant brunt of, of, of that blast. Uh, falls, another aspect of coming in contact with live electrical parts that people don't oftentimes associate with, but we can imagine if an employee is working at height, whether it be on a ladder or an improperly set up scaffolding system, they come in contact with live parts, they're involved in that blast, uh, they might lose their balance or could be blown back or end up falling to a lower level. So the burn, the electrical type injury is now compounded by the fall. So another way that we can protect employees from uh, accessing live parts and, and subsequently becoming injured is to use uh, different types of personal protective equipment. Now we only have a couple listed here that would include safety shoes, you know, typically those would need to be non-conductive, complete your, uh, protect your feet from completing the electrical circuit to ground. Um, so we would want the material to be comprised of leather, you know, thick le leather material with rubber soles, uh, preferably not soaking wet, as well as class B electrical or utility type hard hats. Now other articles of clothing, depending on the risk assessment that may have been performed, could include arc flash related Clothing is consisting of shirts, uh, long sleeve shirts, as well as pants, uh, protective gloves, safety glasses, uh, and even hearing protection. Safe work practices. These are pretty straightforward. Only qualified personnel should work on electrical equipment. Use special insulated tools when working on fuses with energized terminals. And again, that type of work should only be performed by a qualified or authorized personnel or staff member or an employee. Don't use worn or frayed damaged cords and cables. Uh, in construction, temporary cords become damaged from time to time. Uh, it's just a, a point of doing business in that line of work. Those should be replaced uh, aside from you know, making temporary fixes with, with electrical tape or continuing to use them in a damaged condi condition. Don't fasten extension cords with staples, hang from nails, or suspend by wire. Again, with an ever-changing construction site, cords may be rerouted through doorways or windows or walls, but they need to be insulated by other material. Uh, a helpful tip or trick I've seen in the past is using uh, styrofoam pool noodles even, or some other type of uh, insulative material just to soften uh, if there is any impact from a door or if the edge of a door frame or window frame. It's going to protect the outer insulation of the cord and keep it from getting frayed or damaged or cut. Safe work practices continue. De-energize live parts before commencing work. Again, you know, in construction, there may be instances where an employee has to make a repair or uh, some form of service work to a plug-powered piece of equipment. Now, they may not have to technically lock and tag that out as long as they're in complete control of it. But unplugging or shutting the tool off, unplugging it before that work commences is greatly going to limit the chance of any type of an electrical shock or electrocution. Uh, inspect extension cords. There are a couple ways of, of ensuring compliance with this. You know, one would you know, certainly be inspecting cords daily before use, which should be done anyway, but also on a quarterly basis for continuity and proper ground. Avoid contact with overhead lines. Uh, ultimately, we want to stay well beyond 10 feet if we can. Uh, water and electricity don't mix, so certainly try to avoid working with any type of electrical equipment or around it in wet condition. And check your switches and insulation. Make sure your breakers are functioning as they should. 
check insulation on any live circuits or wiring for damage. All right, so let's test your knowledge once again here. Does anybody recognize any hazards? Again, we'll leave it up for a little bit. See what's wrong here. Or is there anything wrong? I don't know, Kylie. There's not a whole lot going on in this picture, but we can see that it's the ground prong. It's missing. Oftentimes those become damaged, bent. Once they're, they're bent back and forth a few times, they often, they often fall off or, or, or sometimes even removed by employees to adapt a cord to a, a two-prong plug. Um, we, we can assume that there could be grounding issues with this tool at this point in time, uh, which could lead to electrocution hazards. So in this case, uh, if this was an expensive power tool, uh, there may be an adequate repair as long as it uh, meets or exceeds the UL rating for the tool. Um, but tape, like I said before, application of, of common electrical tape is, in, in, once the plug's been plugins been re-spliced is not uh, is not a suitable considered a suitable repair so in summary electrical equipment must be listed and labeled I mean everything that's purchased and taken out to a job site should have a UL rating on it and listing free of hazards you know, obvious damage used in a proper manner if you use electrical tools you must be protected from electrical shock and ultimately provide necessary safety equipment. Like we mentioned before, it could be insulated tools, it could be appropriate personal protective equipment as well. All right, for everybody joining us, time for another Insta safety poll. Question is, what is the most common shock-related injury? A, electrical burns, B, electric shock, C, falls, or D, none of the above. So let's Leave this up for a little bit, let the answers come in. Mike, can you help us out with the answer? Hopefully I can. Yeah, the correct answer is A, electrical burns. This one is a little tricky. Most common shock-related injury. So we are considering that the employee was in fact shocked. They came in contact with the live components. So then the most common would be Burns. And like I said before, you know, there are typically three factors uh, that could uh, be applied here to determine the severity of a burn. The amount of current, the path of the current through the body and where the employee did make contact, which in most cases it's typically the hands, and the length of time. So uh, like I said, we may be looking at significant second to third degree burns or significant internal injury. Thanks, Mike. So let's jump right into our next section, caught in between. This section, we're going to discuss the risks of trenching and excavation work, how to protect employees from cave-ins, factors that pose a hazard to employees working in excavations, and what the role of the competent person is. So we'll start right off here. Does anybody recognize any hazards with this? Well, hopefully everyone noticed the fact that an employee is working below what appears to be a large boulder. So I would recommend that people do not make a habit of working under any type of suspended loads, materials, or lifts. Uh, certainly, we don't see any form of a protective system in place, you know, even though it appears a couple timbers have been wedged under that boulder or rock. Uh, I, 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 prob I don't imagine that they would be sufficient enough for the forces that are being imposed or generated there. So let's talk about some of the hazards or risks associated with excavation. One of the most significant is, is the possibility of a cave-in. And it's, it's quite simply that significant because a lot of times people don't get a second chance. If an employee is involved in a cave-in, the pressures exerted on the human body and just this, simply the amount of material that could be moved or shift and come in contact with an employee can cause immediate and significant damage. Um, ultimately, once an employee is encased by material, asphyxiation could occur in just as little as a few minutes. So we need to be mindful of the fact that from a compliance standpoint, once an employee enters into a, in a trench or excavation that's five or more feet deep, some form of a protective system must be used. However, 
there are situations and there have been situations where employees have been involved in cave-ins and have been seriously injured or killed in in trenches or excavations that have been shallower than that. So as listed here in the second the, the fifth bullet point down on this slide, the golden rule, you want to make sure that you make you don't put a, an internal organ or vital organ below the line of, of the edge of the excavation uh, without proper protection. Ultimately, that judgment call should be made by the competent person on site. Uh, if an employee was in a trench that was three and a half or four feet deep, you know, by law, they may not be required to use any type of a, of, a, of a shoring system or benching or sloping technique. But if material were to cave in on a, a, an employee that was kneeled over or bent down, the same results could apply. Employee protection. So like I mentioned before, employees should be protected from cave-ins by using a well-designed protective system. Uh, they need to be factory designed in most cases and include tabulated data or they've been approved by a registered professional engineer. That information should be kept on location where this equipment's used. Uh, certainly the design and type must be able to support expected loads to the system. Uh, every system has its limitations and factors that may pose significant loads or forces could include soil type, could include depth. Uh, so there are depths and different types of soil that we need to be mindful of in relationship to the systems that we're using and plan accordingly. Protective systems options. There are four main ways to protect employees from cave-ins. Uh, the first one would include sloping, which essentially we're removing material that could otherwise shift, move, or cave in on an employee. You know, typically material is excavated at an angle uh, due to depth and soil classification. We have benching, which again with this, we're also removing soil. Um, now, we, there are some, certain types of soil that we can't bench just simply because they're not stable enough. For instance, sand or granulated material is not going to hold a bench properly. Um, but in a way, we're almost mimicking uh, the, the shape of a slope to where we're gradually cutting out material uh, the deeper we go uh, to ultimately prevent it from falling onto employee period. So in most cases, our bench might start at four feet and go out from there. Shoring. We can use hydraulic jack shoring. We could use timber frame shoring. Uh, essentially, we're using material to keep uh, soil and other types of items back away from the employee. Not all that common, uh, but in certain applications it may be used. Shielding. So probably one of the more common aspects of trench protection would be utilizing a trench box. Now there are quite a few specifics that we're not going to mention in this webinar regarding the installation, uh, placement, uh, access, and egress from a trench box but it is a suitable form of protection. All right, so we see two different pictures here. Is this adequate worker protection, Mike, or employees being protected here at all? Well, let's take a look at what's going on. And the picture on the left, I mean, I think it's, again, safe to assume that this employee is working in a trench that's uh, deeper than five feet. Uh, it appears as though it's at least over their head. Um, nothing's in place. No benching, sloping techniques. I don't see any form of uh, shoring or shielding. With that said, we also can see some situations where the spoil piles are stored uh, a bit too closely to the leading edge. Those should be kicked out or pushed out a minimum of two feet from that. You know, that way an employee should be protected or hopefully protected from falling debris or objects. The picture on the right, uh, some shoring that's being used, although uh, from this angle and from what I could tell, it just appears as though it's, it's, not, uh, it's not consistent enough and we don't have enough uh, cave-in protection there for where an employee could ultimately work. It just looks like there, there are too many areas there that uh, could pose a cave-in hazard. That and the fact that there's no access to either one of these two trenches uh, causes significant concern as well. So additional factors that pose hazards to employees. I mentioned before soil classification. Certainly that's one responsibility of the competent person to determine soil classification before work begins. Uh, obviously, the, the poorer the soil, the less stable, uh, the more weight we may have to remove, uh, the, the, the more significant our shoring or shielding may have to be. Uh, obviously, 
the weather conditions play an important role, uh, particularly water content. Now, it should be understood that at no point in time should an employee be in a trench or excavation that has standing water. But even after a rainstorm, if we don't have standing water, obviously soil can become extremely loose and be prone to shifts and movement. Uh, certainly the depth of cut, uh, the deeper we are, obviously the more material can cave in on us when we're working. Uh, other operations in the vicinity, this could be like pictured here, roadway traffic or other vehicle or equipment traffic. You know, those, that type of pressure, movement, or vibration could cause soil stability issues. And then as I mentioned previously, stored materials or tools. Uh, we want to make sure that this stuff is pushed back far enough to where it's not going to be likely to slip or slide or roll or fall into a trench or excavation and strike an employee from above. So a competent person has a pretty important role. There have been a couple of areas throughout this webinar where a competent person should be on site making judgment calls. One would be for scaffold erection and dismantling, and the other here for excavation-related work. Uh, this person should make an in inspection prior to the work commences on a daily basis, uh, but ultimately as needed. I mean, conditions can change. That One of the, the, the main variables associated with construction work is that something may be okay at the start of the day, but halfway through, uh, we may have to make a revision in our protective system. Uh, rainstorms, wind, traffic, staging of materials, these are all factors that could have an effect on an employee working in a trench or excavation, and a competent person should have the knowledge uh, and ultimately the authority to make those changes before something happens. So, in summary, the greatest risk in an excavation is ultimately cave-in, although there are other factors as well. You know, we could be encountering a hazardous atmosphere, you know, water accumulation. Uh, employees can be protected through sloping, benching, shielding, and shoring. So we, we very briefly covered some of the protective systems that can be used. Um, is one other mention I'll make here, I didn't, I didn't discuss it before, could also be mobile equipment uh, falling into uh, the excavation or trench and, uh, and subsequently crushing an employee or worker. So you always have to be on the lookout for the movement of, of that type of mobile equipment and keep it as far away as you possibly can. So let's jump into our final section of the focus score, which is going to be struck by. We're going to discuss the primary causes of struck by fatalities, handling loads, sling inspections, poor positions, and high vis clothing. Okay. Thank you, Kylie. Primary causes of struck by fatalities. This would include falling objects. So how do we get into a situation where we have falling objects? Uh, oftentimes we can have some form of a rigging failure. We'll talk a little bit later on about the importance of sling inspections and proper rigging techniques. Loose or shifting materials. Uh, like I said before, you know, if we're staging materials on the edge of an excavation or staging materials on scaffolding or a rooftop, uh, ultimately if something does move or shift, uh, we can't fight gravity. The material is going to fall to a lower level, and if we have people below it or under it or around it, they could be struck. You know, most objects on a construction site, most materials, um, are relatively heavy. You know, otherwise, we wouldn't really need cranes or uh, earth-moving machinery. We'd be moving everything by hand. Uh, so the, the obvious result is going to be a significant injury due to impact. Equipment tip over or malfunction, one very important aspect of working around any heavy equipment, and I tell people all the time when I do trainings, is never turn your back on it. Don't get complacent. Uh, you can be working with an operator that has 20 or more years of experience. Uh, they might be able to operate the equipment with their eyes closed. Do not get complacent when it comes to working around heavy machinery. Anything can happen. There can be failures, even with the best preventative maintenance programs. As there could be stability issues due to just placement, uh, movement of the lift or load, soil conditions, uh, it loose placement, uh, movement of the lift or load, soil conditions. Uh, at least if you're close enough to the equipment and, you, and you're watching it, uh, you may be able to get out of the way quickly. Lack of overhead protection. We talked in the very beginning of the webinar when we first looked at that residential construction picture of, of employees working on some makeshift scaffolding as well as underneath. Hard hats, in some cases, will protect an employee from impact. 
uh, but ultimately even that form of protection has its limitations. So uh, you, you want to make sure that you're not working underneath any type of material that could otherwise fall in your head period. Vehicle and equipment strikes. So backing up, uh, obviously depending on the equipment there may be considerable blind spots and even if an operator is paying attention to the, their environment around them, an employee could find themselves standing, kneeling, crouching, or just simply walking by a piece of equipment where an operator can't see them. Um, it, it's extremely important to maintain eye contact and visibility with one another when on a job site, uh, especially when backing machinery up or trailers or equipment. Uh, it's often recommended that a spotter is used just to try to identify any potential impact or struck by related uh, situations. Flying objects. So this is one that we really haven't mentioned up to this point, uh, but this can include any one of a number of, of hand or power tools, uh, demolition equipment, chipping equipment, so not just uh, getting struck by large pieces of material or equipment here, but even smaller objects could result in impact related injuries, obviously cuts, lacerations, eye injuries, uh, significant bruising. Crane tip overs and failure incidents. You know, we've seen over the last several years a rash of crane collapses. You know, there have been some, some stricter standards that have come out and are hopefully going to make their way uh, across the nation here with every state uh, as far as operator certification and licensing. Uh, it's, it's critical that operators when they go to set up a crane or move, move a crane on a job site, it has adequate support. We want to make sure that this equipment's not on any type of surface or ground that could be undermined when the crane's moved or under load. We want to make sure outriggers are properly positioned. We want to make sure that we don't overload any equipment, particularly a crane. Uh, you know, much like a forklift, once a lift in, or load is moved out beyond uh, a certain point, things are going to become extremely unstable. And then boom strikes. We, we talked before about the possibility of uh, encountering electrical equipment on site. Uh, not only could that pose a significant hazard, but even striking a structure could be enough to cause a stability issue with a crane and cause a collapse. Fatalities from handling loads. So struck by the load. I, again, I tell people all the time that they should remain at a safe distance from the load as far as possible. It's often recommended that if an employee can, uh, use a tag line. That will still allow them to be able to control the load to a certain extent. If they need to position it, swing it, or move it, also allow them to stay far enough away from it to where if there is a failure, they can move quickly. Rigging equipment failure and rigging equipment overload. So very critical that we make sure that these pieces of equipment are in pristine condition before we go to use them and obviously during any type of a lift. Uh, we ultimately want to make sure that we stay well within their load rating and then improper rigging technique. You know, there are, are several different concerns that we need to keep in mind when we hook up materials and quote-unquote rig them. Um, and we need to be aware of the limitations of the equipment itself. Uh, this is something that employers can train their own employees on. Uh, but it has to be as thorough and as specific as needed, uh, given the, the job requirements. Inspection of slings is pretty straightforward. I mean, obviously, you don't want to see any type of damage uh, in any of the slings that are used, whether they're nylon, whether they're chain, whether they're cable. Um, even though there are some provisions for minimal wear that's permitted, you always want to fall back on manufacturer guidelines or sling type guidelines. Slings should have tags that indicate capacities. This should be attached and legible on every single sling. If the sling could be brand new, if the data tag has been compromised, removed, or defaced, the sling has to be taken out of service. So that's one important aspect of sling use that I really want to emphasize. When you perform an inspection of a sling, if you find any type of, of damage, um, take that to your foreman or job site supervisor, discuss it, uh, you know, weigh it out the, the, the possibilities of removing that sling from service completely. And if it is found to be damaged, make sure it's taken off the job site. Simply taking a damaged sling 
and hanging it up in a job trailer or placing it off to the side may not completely eliminate another employee who maybe has not done as a thorough inspection from using it. You know, a damage sling, using a damage sling is like a time bomb. You don't know when they're going to snap or break or fail. It likely would be no warning to a, an employee or a passerby. One of the other aspects that we've talked about is poor positioning, and this would indicate poor positioning. Uh, you never want to get your body or, or an employee in between uh, two objects, you know, a rock and a hard place, so to speak. So always position yourself off to the side of a piece of equipment to where if something does happen, a piece of equip equipment shifts, moves, or is driven in any direction, uh, there's ample time and space for an employee to move suddenly and get out of the way. And this would include heavy equipment like you see pictured here. This would include movement and staging of materials as well. And I know you quickly touched on equipment rollovers, tip overs, and you can see just from these pictures how unfortunate it is that this does happen. So employees do need to be aware of this. Yeah, Kylie, equipment does roll over. And again, this could be something that a competent person on site has analyzed ahead of time and there could have been factors during the actual movement of material and shifting of material that caused a stability issue with, with the piece of equipment and resulted in the tip over. You know, particularly earth handling uh, uh, vehicles and, and trucks, when those are offloading or dumping, you never want to stand anywhere close to the sides of that equipment just due to the material and how it could shift and how that could have an effect on stability. Um, so again, like I said before, if you keep a safe distance and you keep your eyes on the mobile equipment, um, you should hopefully be able to avoid getting into a situation where if the equipment does roll over, you suffer a significant struck by related injury. Now one way that we can minimize uh, the likelihood of a vehicle strike or being struck by other pieces of heavy equipment is to increase our visibility to the operators and others around us. Uh, the, the application or use of high-vis vests uh, or even fluorescent colored shirts will aid in that. However, just like I mentioned before with hard hats, ultimately this piece of clothing is not going to protect you or do anything if you, if you are struck. Um, so this is just merely to increase visibility, increase the chances that an operator who otherwise might not see you you know, they catch, that, they catch that fluorescent green or yellow clothing or shirt out of the corner of their eye and they stop before a strike actually occurs. All right, on to our last and final Insta safety poll. Question here, true or false, all nylon and chains must have legible tags on them. And I do remember, I know you touched on this, so let's see if everyone remembers. Yeah, Kylie, that was, a, that was a pretty easy one. Hopefully everyone got that one right out there. They do need to have legible tags. I mean, we need to be aware of the load rating as well as certain load ratings depending on the rigging technique, and those tags should give us some insight to that. Okay, everyone. In summary, the focus four hazards are responsible for the majority of physical, financial, and emotional losses in construction, and they do exist on nearly every job site. So it doesn't matter if this is a small residential job up to a significant job site in a big city. It takes a well-trained crew, everyone, everyone from the, the job site supervisor or foreman to the person that's their second day on the job to recognize any type of hazards and be able to respond to those hazards as necessary. Safety is everyone's responsibility, and it's not, ju it's not just some of the time, it's all of the time. Thanks so much, Mike. And you are right. It is everyone's responsibility, like you said, all of the time. If anyone is looking for any more information on some of the topics and things that we covered, you can find it here on these references here on the slide. And we really just want to thank everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions on any of the things that we covered, feel free to give us a call. The phone number is 888-403-6026. Or you can even check out our website at LancasterSafety.com. And Mike, thank you again for being here with us today. And thanks for your time. Thank you, Kylie.
Everyone have a great day. Thank you.